All right, well, we'll, we'll let the others wander in. Uh, Jason is going to talk to us about his book on Charlie Murphy, the owner of the Chicago Cubs for a decade early in this early in the previous century. Uh, and uh, Jason, I'll let you go ahead and tell us how we should remember Charlie Murphy. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to be with you this evening. Again, my name is Jason Cannon. Um, I actually belong currently to the Rocky Mountain Saver chapter. I've bounced around a little bit. Uh, around the country, but uh, excited to be with you. Let me go ahead and share my screen with you. And what we'll do is talk a little bit about Charlie Murphy here. I think one of the most interesting things about this entire experience has, has been uh, the opportunity to introduce someone who not a lot of even big time baseball fans are particularly familiar with. And so it, it's been a really fun couple of months to, to talk about Charlie and his life and his experience owning the Cubs. And so it's it's a great pleasure to be with you this evening. So so thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Charlie Murphy, the iconoclastic showman behind the Chicago Cubs, it came about um, as part of a different research project that I'll touch on in just a second. But I think one of the most important things I wanted to share with you just from the outset is that the book is about Charlie Murphy. But as I pursued the project, the, the book really became uh, about five different th things. And so just wanted to share those with you. The first, Murphy's life and career. And we'll talk quite a bit about that uh, during the presentation tonight. But four other things that I think play an important role in this story. Uh, the Irish immigrant experience being right at the top of the list uh, for me, Charlie's parents both immigrated from Ireland, and, and we'll talk about their lives uh, this evening as well. Also, of course, you have the most successful Chicago Cubs team in history in Murphy's eight full seasons of ownership, 1906 through 1913. The ball club won four pennants, two World Series championships, and never finished below third place. And at one point, there's a great quote in uh, Kate Murphy's book, Crazy 08, in which Frank Chance says, whoever heard of the Cubs losing a game they had to win? And so it was definitely a different era in Cubs history uh, than, than perhaps um, us these days are more accustomed to, with uh, 2016 being the, the exception and perhaps that, that nucleus of that ball club. Uh, so the most successful Cubs team in, in franchise history when Murphy was at the helm. Also, I, I think really uniquely in Murphy's story is you have the developing relationship between organized baseball and the White House. We'll talk about Murphy's friendship with President Taft. And specifically that friendship came about because of Murphy's working relationship with the president's older half brother, Charles Phelps Taft. And that's a very interesting story. And they were business partners for a long time. Uh, and it began with the purchase of the Chicago Cubs in the middle of 1905. And then finally, the business of baseball from 1890 to 1914, you have very quickly, rapidly developing business practices that were new to the game. It was um, becoming more of a corporate entity, yes, but what was really taking place uh, simultaneously that really took the game to another level was the public relations side of things. John T. Brush, who first owned the Reds and then later the Giants, was really a pioneer in that area and starting to think about those things. But his, one of his main protégés, Charlie Murphy, took the public relations side of baseball to a whole nother level. And that's a really important part of our story as well. So when I kind of take a step back and think about the book, I think about these five things that we'll talk about tonight that I think are, are all important elements to the story as a whole. First, how did I get interested in studying Charlie Murphy? Well, I'm from, I'm from a little town in California, uh, just south of Fresno, uh, uh, Visalia. And there was a player, Orville Overall, which is a name for the ages. And Overall was the winning pitcher in 1908 of the clinching game of the World Series. And when the Cubs won the pennant in 2016, a friend of mine sent me a text message. Hey, you'll, you'll never guess who the final pitcher for the Cubs in 1908 was who threw the World Series game clinching pitch. It was a guy from our hometown. We had never heard of him somehow. And we'd heard of quite a few other players. 
And so I got interested in overall in his story and wrote a couple of pieces on him. But in the midst of doing that, I kept coming across these contract battles that overall had with the club's owner, Charlie Murphy. And I thought, man, I've never heard of Charlie Murphy. Who, who is this? I mean, surely he knew what he was doing on some level, right? Because the ball club was so successful. He, he couldn't have been that, you know, uh, that bad at his job that, that he should be unknown these days. And so that was kind of the initial spark that got me to look into Charlie Murphy's story. And the more I dug around, the more interesting it became. And that's really what uh, spearheaded the, the entire project about, well, now it's about six years ago. And so the natural question is, who was Charlie Murphy? And here's a picture of Charlie in his older years. And what I discovered about Murphy was that really three main things. Who was he in terms of, of, of his uh, profession, professional life? Number one, he was a pioneering journalist. Number two, he was a public relations genius. And then number three, he was a very successful baseball owner. And so I think in a nutshell, if I were to put together a thesis statement and present it to you as to why we should even be interested in uh, Murphy's life and its consequences, I, I would put those three things together and offer them to you as uh, a reason why his achievements and how he went about accomplishing those things are, are important. So again, the journalist side, the PR genius aspect of things, and then his success with the Cubs. And the way that I started the book in the introduction is I focused on an obituary written by Hugh Fullerton, uh, the Hall of Fame baseball writer. And Fullerton was close personal friends with Murphy. They grew up about 20 miles apart in Southwest Ohio. Murphy was from a small town called Wilmington and Fullerton was from Hillsboro. And Fullerton knew Murphy back when. He knew him as a young teenager who was forced to go to work downtown to help support his mother and siblings um, because his father was struggling with addiction to such a degree that um, Patrick, his, Charlie's father, Patrick could no longer take care of the family. And so Charlie was essentially doing it as the eldest child. And so Murphy, who late, in later years became really well known for his quirks and his intensity and his, um, shall we say, gamesmanship, um, Fullerton saw through all that. Fullerton saw and knew the sensitive kid underneath the layers of bluster that Murphy presented in his later years. And so I started the book with Fullerton's obituary because Fullerton says uh, to all of his readers, essentially, Murphy during his heyday was absolutely at the center of the baseball world. And that was for a number of reasons. The Cubs were winning. Um, there was always something controversial happening around Murphy or something controversial that Murphy uh, engaged with, whether it be with the commissioner's office or another team or, or something in the press. Um, and, and so Fullerton acknowledges that after Murphy passes away in 1931. And so uh, on a personal note, absolutely no one has any idea who I am, nor should they. And so my idea was, don't take my word for it, take Hugh Fullerton's word for it, that Murphy was a very consequential figure in this era and should be continued to talk, be talked about at that point in the 30s. And then I'm proposing to people that, you know, 90 years later, we should still be talking to him at least to a certain degree. And so that was kind of trying to not just present Murphy's life, but a little bit of how the book came together, why I chose to make uh, Fullerton a key part of the introduction. But Hugh absolutely has a nuanced view of Murphy that very, other, very few others in the baseball world had because they only knew him through one lens, and that was through business. Uh, but Fullerton knew him personally. And so um, I thought it was a really special obituary that he wrote uh, after he passed away and, and a really interesting way to, or at least a hopefully an interesting way for, for readers to be introduced uh, to Murphy. When we talk about Murphy's story, we have to talk about, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the Irish immigration story. And this starts with the Great Famine in the mid 19th century. And both Again, both of Murphy's parents immigrated from Ireland. They came over uh, from different counties 
and they came over in different years. And it was very hard to track his father, Patrick Murphy. There were so many logs of Patrick Murphy's that fit potential possibilities. It was hard to exactly pinpoint. But what we do know is that Patrick Murphy came from County Cork. And instead of staying on the Eastern seaboard as a teenager, he ends up settling in Cincinnati. His mother, on the other hand, was from County Tipperary, and Bridget and her mother immigrate, and they too end up in Ohio. And so it's a really interesting aspect to start the story to discuss the demographics of Ohio. And this is kind of a tough map, uh, a tough um, a document to read. But in the lower left-hand corner, kind of highlighted in that box, I'll just you know read it out loud. It shows that in the year 1880, the state of Ohio was actually sixth in the country in terms of foreign born populations behind the East Coast states, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, et cetera. You see Ohio is a number six. And so just really was an interesting aspect of how in Cincinnati along the Ohio River, there was a Catholic population that, that settled there. And Patrick was absolutely a part of that before he makes a move. He's 14 years old, living in Cincinnati, and he develops a trade, plastering, and he moves to Wilmington. It's about you know, 50 miles away, takes you a little less than an hour to drive today from Cincinnati to Wilmington. At Wilmington is a booming small town, which is kind of a, a unique, kind of awkward way to phrase it, but it was a place where the railroad was starting to be built. And so what Patrick was really aware of, here you see a photo in 1916. So this is a couple of decades later, but Wilmington in, uh, went through a building spat that was really quite remarkable. All of the government buildings were uh, put up in a matter of years. The railroad was recruited and built and Patrick was right in the middle of it. And he worked very hard to make sure that he got government contracts to plaster these buildings. And it led directly to his unique involvement, not only with government officials, but also with judges. And essentially, Patrick became a very well-known person throughout the Wilmington community. He even was hired by um, Judge West to work on his private residence. And so he did really good work and was well-known throughout the community. Well, Patrick meets Ellen Murray, who is his young bride, his young first wife, who um, also was settling there in Ohio with her family. And tragically, Ellen Murray died in childbirth. And it's a very sad development, but one that's not particularly uncommon. And so Patrick loses his young wife um, early on in their marriage. Then right on top of that situation, Webster Ferguson, who's Patrick's business partner, uh, is hurt in an accident. And I didn't include it in the book because I came across only anecdotal evidence and I could never nail it down with multiple sources. But from an anecdotal perspective, the story that goes around is that Webster, during a plastering project, fell off a ladder and hit his head on the, the ground so hard that it caused permanent brain damage. And as a result, Webster just lost his grip on reality and really suffered very traumatic injury and consequences as a result of this accident. And eventually Webster is institutionalized. And so in a matter of a very short amount of time, Patrick loses his wife as well as his best friend and business partner. And so it's a very tragic beginning to Patrick's you know, adult years there in Wilmington. And then not, not too many years, about two years, year and a half, two years later, Patrick meets and marries Bridget O'Donnell there in Wilmington. And their first child is Charlie. And so Charlie's born in 1868. And at that point, Patrick is still having some success. He's adding property to his real estate portfolio. Business is going pretty well. But not too long after that, it starts to collapse. And the weight of all of Patrick's experiences really starts to, um, you now he really struggles with it. And he more and more consistently turns to alcohol to soothe his, you know, his very deep pain, really. And as a result, he becomes 
less engaged at home. And one of the ways that Charlie and his younger siblings, as they're born, his younger brothers, he had two younger brothers and a younger sister, and they're born every two years, his, his siblings. Uh, they cope more and more by just not going home. They go to the local fields to play baseball. And so Charlie, Frank, and Jim are off playing baseball in their, uh, their youth and uh, as their home life deteriorates. And so it's a way not only to avoid going home, but Charlie very quickly falls in love with the game of baseball. And so he wants to make it part of his permanent uh life, but it's only a hobby at that point, right? He wasn't a good enough player. And as I mentioned earlier, he has to then go to work after school to support his family at the local drugstore. And so he starts learning the drug clerk trade in order to support his family. Uh, and not too long after that, he moves to Cincinnati to further his education. And so he becomes a drug clerk in Cincinnati. He's about 18, 19, 20. We're not exactly sure, but he's about in that area, about a time frame. And as he gets to know people in Cincinnati coming in and out of the drugstore, he strikes up a friendship with several journalists. And those journalists learn of his passion for baseball. And they say, oh, Charlie, you got to get into writing with us. You're such a good storyteller, which he was. He loved to tell stories and he loved to talk about the ball game and he loved to just make up tales on his own anyway. He, he really was a storyteller. And so by 1892, Murphy takes a job with the Cincinnati Inquirer. And so not too long after that, he goes from writing on the crime police beat to writing about sports. And this is where his ability to write about professional baseball opens up that entire world to him. And so at a really key point in time in 1892, Charlie Murphy is a journalist writing about baseball. Charlie Comiskey has recently been hired to manage and play first base for Cincinnati. And Ben Johnson is in the tail end, at the tail end of his career as a writer before John T. Brush uh, <laughs> helps get him the, the job as president of the Western League. And that was to a large degree done on purpose because Johnson used to rip Brush, uh, who owned the Reds at the time, he used to rip him in the press consistently and so Brush thought, what a great way to get rid of Johnson. We'll make him president of this random league over here. And little did he know that by doing that, he would create essentially his biggest rival uh, for the remainder of his years in professional baseball. So one of the key questions we, we talked about earlier was who was Murphy? He was a journalist. And how did he cover baseball? Well, he did something that really hadn't been done too much before, and that was cover the offseason. So here's an example of Murphy would travel to the winter meetings in New York and he would write about all the rumors. They, in those days, they called it the dope. Who had the inside dope? And Murphy would ask everyone he could about the dope that he could write about. And he really made it a point to put it in the newspaper because during the season, so many readers wanted to follow the team. Literacy rates were on the rise. And so that also uh, facilitated more and more fans reading about the ball game. And so Murphy said, let's take advantage of this and let's talk about the off season as well. And so he covered baseball in that way. And what he did is he turned the winter meeting into a show. He made it a big deal. One year, the, the owners were behind closed doors in a boardroom in New York, having a, you know, a conversation about whatever business they happened to be discussing. And Murphy was down in the bar with the other writers and the owners were not coming down for interviews, coming downstairs for interviews. And Murphy got all the writers together and marched them right up to that boardroom, banged on the door. And when someone opened the door, uh, Murphy stuck his head in the room and said, we've already decided who won the pennant. We've already decided who was going to change the rules to what. Uh, we've made all the tough decisions as the writers. And so now it's time for you to give us interviews. And uh, President Nick Young of the National League at the time said, OK, come on in. You guys can do your interviews. Uh, but one of the really important aspects of this was John T. Brush was in the back of the room and he was a grouchy, tough guy. And he was thoroughly amused at Murphy's personality, kind of his gumption. Uh, but also he was just uh, really intrigued by Mur Murphy's personality, which was so different than his own. But the one thing they had in common is that they wanted to promote the game. 
And that was at times for selfish reasons and also at times um, for the good of the sport. But it all worked out well in terms of uh, Brush promoting the Reds and then Murphy selling newspapers. And so that's initially how Brush was intrigued by Murphy. And when Brush buys the New York Giants in 1905, um, he's very interested in hiring Murphy. And so they have conversations and he takes them with him to New York to become the first press agent uh, really in the history of the game where that was his sole responsibility of the New York Giants in 1905. But before that happens, there's an important step in there to share. And that is that Charles Phelps Taft owned the Cincinnati Times Star and Taft observes what Murphy's doing in town and what a whirlwind he is. Murphy's full of energy. He gets the story. He's, he's constantly working about town to write uh, about a number of things over the years. And he becomes a well-known journalist. And Taft, you know, he, he pays attention. He sees what's happening. And so Taft woos Murphy away from the Inquirer to work for his paper, the Cincinnati Times Star. Murphy agrees to do that. And he serves in that capacity for a number of years. And they both really enjoy working with each other. Taft is the head of the paper, trusted what Murphy did and empowered him to do his job. And Murphy loved the freedom that Taft gave him and did really good work for him. And so it was that friendship that down the road, that working relationship that developed into a friendship that down the road would change the history of the Chicago Cubs forever. So he works for Taft's paper, but in the meantime, Brush hires him and takes him with him to New York in 1905. Before we get to Murphy's smartest move in baseball, let's take just a moment to talk about how in the world Murphy went from being a journalist to a PR guy to the owner of the Cubs. And what happened was Murphy would go ahead of the New York Giants in 1905 to some of the cities where they were going to be playing on upcoming road trips. And he would talk to reporters and give them stories. It sounds almost like a modern day PR guy or an SID. And then Murphy was doing that type of work. He goes to Chicago and he is having a conversation with Jim Hart, who at the time was the president of the Cubs. And Jim Hart tells him, well, you're not going to believe this, Charlie, but the Cubs, I think the Cubs are going to be up for sale. And Murphy can't believe it. He said, what's going on? Why, how are they going to be up for sale? And Hart tells him, well, our owner, John Walsh, he's in financial trouble. And some of his business dealings, uh, the feds are starting to sniff around what's going on with some of the liquidity questions and his business practices and things like that. And so Walsh needs money very quickly for uh, his own legal defense and also potentially to infuse in his businesses that he borrowed money from to, to use personally, right? So he's, Walsh is trying to move around the, uh, his stacks of dollars to, to make this thing work. As a result, the easiest way for him to get cash was to move the Cubs immediately. And so Hart tells Murphy this, and he says, well, how much are they going to be? And in the back of Murphy's mind, he knew that Brush had sold the Reds before buying the Giants for 150000 So when Hart tells Murphy that the Cubs are going to be sold for around $100,000, Murphy's just shocked. And Murphy looks out on the field. They're, they're at the ballpark. He looks out on the field, and he sees all the young talent. And he says to Hart, I don't have the money right now, but if you give me a little bit of time, I'll go get it for you. And they agree on a verbal option to buy the ball club. And Murphy hops on the first train down to Cincinnati. He bounces into Taft's office and he says, Mr. Taft, we have the opportunity of a lifetime and we've got to take advantage of it. The Cubs are going to be for sale. We've got to buy them. I need to borrow $100,000. And Taft at first, well, I'm not sure. I'm not, I, I like baseball, but I don't know if I want to invest in it. And after a short kind of, you know, he's wavering back and forth for just a short period of time, but he agrees to do it. And so Murphy and Taft fulfill their side of the option. Uh, you'll see the number 105,000 a lot. And that's an anecdotal number. I couldn't find it in the Taft family ledgers, but supposedly that extra 5,000 was a bonus to Hart for, uh, you know, transacting the sale or kind of serving as a front person for selling the club. But the $100,000 purchase price goes through. And so Taft and Murphy out of nowhere become owners of the Cubs. And this is the middle of 1905. 
And so Murphy becomes the vice president of the Cubs. He moves from New York to Chicago in a whirlwind, about six, seven months. He goes from being a newspaper writer from the Time Star to the PR guy of the Giants to the vice president of the Cubs. Half a year. It's an amazing story. And Taft says, you know what you're doing. You take care of it. So Murphy and Hart reach a deal. Hart's going to remain the president for the rest of the year and show Murphy the ropes. Murphy's going to stay the vice president president of the club, and then in 1906, take over full time. So the most interesting aspect of, of what was happening on the field for the Cubs in 1905, as far as their future went, is that their manager, Frank Seeley, had been an incredibly successful manager, first in Boston, then Chicago. He took ill, very ill, and was forced to step away from the club about halfway through the year. And there was course a young player on that Cubs roster who was respected by everyone in the clubhouse and that was Frank Chance and so Frank Chance was named the interim manager of the Cubs after Seeley had to step away from the team and so Chance manages the club the rest of the year so as Murphy is learning the business under Hart Chance is leading the club they perform fairly well they're still pretty young at this point the, the nucleus is still young but the smartest thing Murphy ever did in baseball was during the off season after the 1905 season, Murphy becomes a primary shareholder of the team, elevated the team president, and he signs Frank Chance to a multi-year contract to manage and play for the Chicago Cubs. Smartest thing Murphy ever did. The most interesting aspect of the contract, in my opinion, is that Murphy actually made Chance a co-owner of the ball club. And I, in fact, in one of the other uh, presentations I gave, some other um, individuals shared with me how that was at times uh, a, a question that other managers had, uh, John McGraw, for instance, uh, Connie Mack. And so I know it was an aspect of, of these types of negotiations. And yet Murphy and Chance, both unproven, um, you know, Chance had managed about 60 games. Murphy, without hesitating, says, I want to make you 10% owner of the Cubs, and we're partners. We're in this together. We're peers. You know, he didn't view him as anything other than a peer. And it was also an important step for Murphy. No one knew who he was. You know, he had no credibility whatsoever. And so he knew that by partnering with Chance rather than hiring him, you know, a little bit of a nuanced difference there. Uh, it would go a long way towards helping them build a good relationship as they worked on um, you know, building the roster. And it absolutely did just that. In that off season, prior to the 1906 campaign, Murphy made three trades. Now Chance and Murphy operated in unison on these deals, um, but Murphy got them done and Chance was incredibly impressed. The two deals that they worked on, Pat Moran was uh, acquired as a backup catcher to Johnny Kling. And then the other deal, Harry Steinfeld traded uh, from Cincinnati to Chicago. The Cubs acquire him to play third base to solidify that position. So the infield solidified. We all know Tinker Evers chance. Steinfeld played third, good player, had been hurt in Cincinnati, but Murphy had been in Cincinnati quite a bit as a journalist. And he knew Steinfeld's knee wasn't as bad as everyone was trying to pretend to, or portray it as it was and then finally kind of the the amazing trade that shook the baseball world you know Jimmy Sheckard had had a few good years in Baltimore and then in Brooklyn but he was also unhappy and didn't want to play for Brooklyn anymore they were a bad club and McGraw knew Sheckard from Baltimore and wanted to acquire him in New York Pittsburgh was also very interested in Sheckard and Murphy's thought was, well, if they're if Sheckard's good enough for New York and Pittsburgh, and he's definitely good enough for us. And so he calls up Charlie Ebbets, and uh, he made a proposal that Ebbets couldn't refuse. I believe it was four players in cash. I mean, just at the time considered out of nowhere an amazing haul for Brooklyn. And yet Chicago got the better end of the deal for sure. I mean, Sheckard turned into an everyday player, solidified the lineup. And Chance was thrilled with these moves. And he made it very clear in the press 
that a lot of owners talk about making these deals to improve the club, but very few of them actually follow through on their word. And here Murphy had gone out and acquired Moran, Steinfeld, and now Sheckard. And Chance was thrilled with these developments. And it earned Murphy Chance's respect. And it was at this point that their partnership was solidified and their successful run uh, was really ready to take off. So in their first full year together with this core, they reached the World Series. And of course, they're upset by the Chicago White Sox. The hitless wonders out of nowhere seemingly uh, shock the Cubs and upset them in the World Series. This is a really important learning experience for the young club. And Chance is upset. Murphy's graceful in defeat. But this loss really spurred um, their next two seasons in which they won World Series titles. But uh, for the sake of time, I don't want to spend too much time recapping the seasons. But it was important to just touch on 1906. They lose and then they go home and really uh, set their mind to uh, bouncing back in 07, 08, which they do. One of the interesting nuance aspect, nuanced aspects of uh, the, the, the relational side between Murphy and the Taft family starts to develop in the spring of 1907. Charlie Murphy sends William Howard Taft, who was then Secretary of War, season tickets. You can come to the ballpark anytime you would like. And here's an example of a letter where Taft's, um, Taft's people write a note back to Murphy thanking him for the tickets. But then Taft adds a personal note and he writes, thank you for your kindly expressions. If the sentiment you referred to, which was Murphy's confidence in Taft's ability to capture the presidential nomination, if the sentiment that you refer to grows so fast as the prestige of the Chicago club under your management, it will certainly be formidable. And so Murphy and Taft uh, were friends and remained friends for years, uh, obviously with their you know, common friendship with Charles Phelps Taft and Taft's obviously relationship with his half brother being in the midst of that. But you really see the development of the relationship between the National League in particular and the White House with President Taft. You know, Roosevelt didn't like baseball at all, didn't care about it. Taft on the other hand, as we all know, was a huge fan and he had a great relationship with Charlie Murphy and went to a number of games. And it's one of the chapters in the book uh, that, that covers their burgeoning friendship. In 1907, the Cubs win their first World Series title. They beat Detroit. And here you see this giant swollen crowd in the streets of Chicago following the ticker and celebrating the victory. It was a, a monument, monumental achievement for the young team. And uh, uh, everyone was thrilled with the result as they achieve uh, the pinnacle of, of baseball accomplishments there in 1907. And then they go out there and do it again in 1908. And they defeat Detroit again. And they're the first back-to-back -back World Series champions. However, 1908, during the World Series, there's a ticket scandal. And there are many fans who don't get tickets to games because the tickets are actually in the hands of scalpers. And many of the fans were furious about it. Murphy claimed that he didn't know how the scalpers got a hold of all the tickets. Uh, an investigation, you know, suggested that someone in the Cubs front office could have made a mistake. He sanctioned for it. At the same time, Charlie Williams and Charlie Thomas, the two primary uh, Chicago Cubs front office employees, say the turnaround was too fast. We did our best. We didn't know who was who. We knew our season ticket holders. We took care of them. But everyone else wanting tickets we you know it was just it turned into a mess but as a result of this issue the angered cubs fans a large chunk of them stayed away from the world series games they just boycotted going to the games and as a result the ticket gate was less and that meant a smaller payout for the players once the series was over and that started the war of eight, uh, 1908 1909 between chance and murphy Chance was very upset at the idea that Murphy could have been involved in this ticket scalping scandal. And as a result, his players received a smaller payout because of the lower gate. Murphy argued to Chance, you own 10% of the club. You're fine. All, all we've done over the last few years is help you make money because 
your shares have gone up, the value that 10% chunk of the club you own is more valuable. Chance was furious, didn't, didn't want to hear about it, and ultimately went home to California and was not going to go back to the Cubs. He was not going to return to the club. Uh, Harvey Woodruff, who was the editor uh, at the Chicago Tribune and was a mutual friend of both men, went out to the West Coast and soothed things over. They both exchanged a series of telegrams where Murphy was contrite and Chance, you know, accepted essentially Murphy's pseudo apology and he returned to the team. But this is where Chance was almost lost. Now, as the years go on, Murphy's now in his fourth season of ownership, fourth, fifth season of ownership. He's always thinking. One of the ideas that he has, for example, is he wants to make the World Series a best of nine. And it almost passed. We almost had a best of nine World Series. Uh, the one person who did not want the best of nine World Series was Comiskey. And Murphy respected Comiskey so much that when Comiskey didn't want it, uh, Murphy backed down. But every other owner, every owner in the National League agreed to it, and nearly all the American League owners agreed to it as well. Comiskey's argument was that uh, he felt that the American League pennant battle always came down to the end of the season, and the National League winner tended to cruise to the pennant over there. So he thought they've got a chance to rest and set their rotations where we don't. But Murphy was always thinking about ideas that were outside the box to promote the game, promote the business side of baseball. And that's just one example. Horace Fogel um, is a really interesting figure we talk about in the book pretty extensively. And as we kind of wind down this presentation tonight, just want to touch on him briefly. Fogel was a former journalist and baseball man who Taft and Murphy uh, tapped to help them and really what was a scheme essentially to develop syndicate baseball in Philadelphia. Um, Fogel uh, agrees to become president of the Phillies and the team is bought under the guise that Fogel has an ownership group, but in reality, the money came from Taft and Murphy. And they weren't necessarily gonna create a syndicate where players were traded, but there, you know, that was it, it was a thing you just couldn't touch, nor should you. And here they are with Fogel as a front man, and then they they not only acquire the team, but also the Baker Bowl as well. And this blows up in Murphy's face. It just it totally back uh, backfires. And there's a trial in the National League, and it comes out that Murphy has actually is actually the man behind an article that Fogel wrote that accused umpires of being biased in favor of the New York Giants and other you know, accusations. Fogel puts his name on it, but he only put his name on it because Murphy asked him to, and because Murphy had put him in this position uh, of being president of the Phillies. So it's a mess and it blows up and Taft is embarrassed. Taft was really introverted. He and his half brother are very different. Uh, Charles Taft, behind the scenes, introverted, didn't want his name in the news. And so it was a really uh, big disaster for the two of them. Taft sells the club and uh, Murphy's reputation in the league is, is just damaged beyond repair. And this coming on the heels of Murphy's reputation being hurt deeply with the ticket scandal with Chance in his own clubhouse. And so all the relationships are deteriorating around Murphy. And here's a guy who never really concerned himself with building political alliances, and now he has none to fall back on. And so he's in a really bad spot. This is all capped off early in 1914. Um, Chance and Murphy did have a falling out a few years later where uh, Chance is, is let go. I won't touch on that tonight, but it's covered extensively in the book. But Chance is replaced by Johnny Evers. Evers managing the club in 1913 bothers Charles Taft a lot because he gets ejected. Shouldn't have been a surprise, uh, but was for some reason. Um, Taft didn't like his boisterous behavior. Murphy was upset because he signed Evers to two contracts, one to manage, one to play. And he said, every time you get ejected, I have to pay you twice to do nothing because you're not out there managing and you're not out there playing. And so Murphy fires Evers. What's also happening is that you have the Federal League, which I know many of you know about. And the Federal League is emerging as a competitor to the National League. And the other National League owners are concerned that Evers could be snapped up by the Federal League. They could sign him to essentially, a, 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 he could just, he could 
jump, jump to the federal league. And then they lose the national league loses one of its biggest stars and the owners get together and they say, this cannot be allowed to continue. And way back when 1892, we touched on Van Johnson and Murphy, both being in Cincinnati together. Johnson at this point, just, just loathes Murphy, just loathes him. And they've become, you know, arch enemies over time. And Johnson uses it as an opportunity to get rid of, of Murphy. So he really spearheads a movement where he threatens the National League owners by saying, you know, we'll, we'll cut off all relations unless you get rid of the guy. And so Murphy's ousted. And Taft initially is against it. He wants Murphy to stay, but finally agrees for the good of the league, the good of the National League, that Murphy will go. And so Murphy's forced to sell the club. The team was bought for $100,000, but here you can see it's kind of hard. It's small print, but you can see this was taken from um, Anna Taft's papers. This is her, the Taft family financial ledgers. Anna was uh, Charles Felt Taft, uh, his wife. And you can see $450,000 was the primary payment here. Now, there's a whole other story of how that was paid out and what went into that, but the point being here that it was an extraordinarily successful business venture for Murphy, uh, making over uh, making four and a half times the amount of money. And what does he do? He goes home and he pivots and he decides to build a theater, which is kind of a, a unique thing to do. But Murphy always loved the performing arts. And he goes home to Wilmington, his small town we talked about earlier, and he decides to build a state of the art theater. So he spends a quarter of a million dollars and he imports all these furnishings from Europe, uh, domestically from New York, and he creates this beautiful theater that opens up in Wilmington. And here's a picture of, of it on the verge of opening night. And then you can see it today. It still stands with a new marquee, but I was out there for the 100th uh, anniversary a few years ago, and this is what it looks like today. So at that point, Murphy, takes a step back. He lives the rest of his days out, mainly in Chicago, going back and forth to see some of his family in Wilmington. He remained a Cubs fan his entire life. He went and saw the Cubs play at Wrigley Field. Of course, he, he had nothing to do with Wrigley Field. They played in the West Side grounds when he owned the team. But uh, once the ball club is eventually sold there, after a couple of years of negotiation, the, the club goes from Taft to Charles Wiegman, as many of you know. And Wiegman Park, which was built for the Federal League, becomes uh, renamed Wrigley Field down the road. Uh, Murphy went there. He attended ball games and remained a Cubs fan, and it was never personal, even though he had essentially lost the team or could have felt that it was taken away from him. Um, you know, there's never any hard feelings when it came to business with Murphy. He was able to compartmentalize and remained a huge fan uh, for the rest of his days and, and, and enjoyed the theater as well. So thank you so much for your time. Here's a little bit of my information. It's, it's been great to get a chance to share a little bit about Murphy with you today. And uh, wonderful to have the opportunity. He was a really unique guy. Uh, the team was very successful. Uh, they've longed, longed for many years to have the same success in present times that they did under his tenure. And for um, being wiped out from history because of the uh, alleged transgressions at the end, some justified, some maybe uh, exaggerated a little bit. The fascinating thing in going back and examining his life was he was a consequential journalist, he was a public relations genius, and he was the most successful owner that the Chicago Cubs have ever had. So thank you for your time and uh, appreciate it so much. Jason, thank you. That was great. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions if you want to unmute yourself uh, and ask something. Jason, I just said, excuse me, just one thing that, just one point to, to clarify, maybe I'm wrong or maybe I misunderstood. Just the thing about who went out to California regarding to talk with Frank Chance. I always thought it was Harry Pulliam who went out. Pulliam and Johnson had gone out to California to try to straighten out the fight between the California State League, the Pacific Coast League, and Pulliam had taken time out, had stayed out there to specifically go out and talk to Chance. In fact, what happened was it ended up being, resulting in a feud between Murphy, Murphy with saying Pulliam was taking the credit for keeping Chance on and which continued on pretty much till yeah. Pulliam's death several months later. So I'm not sure I, I hadn't seen before about 
Woodruff getting credit for, I had seen Pulliam getting credit for it. So this one uh, thing I have a different read on. No, I appreciate you mentioning that. You're exactly right. Um, it's, it's part of picking and choosing what goes into, into a talk a little bit uh, from a time perspective, but you're hundred percent right. Your read on that is, is accurate. Um, there's a, a section of the book, one of the chapters where I spend half the chapter examining basically the last few months of Pulliam's life. And you're hundred percent right. Pulliam went and talked to Chance twice. Uh, I believe once before Christmas and then once after. And Woodruff was the one who, who got Chance, uh, he was with Chance, but then he would go to the telegraph office and then get Murphy on the other line. But Polium had laid the groundwork for that conversation. You are 100% right. Polium was more concerned about losing a National League star, um, whereas Woodruff was more concerned about losing chance for what he had become what he had and he meant a lot to Chicago and so it was more personal he was a personal friend but also it was more a Chicago focus in the aftermath though you're 100 percent right what's really interesting about that is Pulliam always in the last few months of his life he resented not getting the credit he felt he deserved for repairing that relationship between Chance and Murphy. And he felt that Woodruff got too much credit um, and he was upset about it. And at one point there were letters, critical letters that were leaked to the press and they were critical of Murphy in the situation. And everyone knew that Pulliam or suspected I should say that Pulliam had done it, but he denied it. Uh, but it was absolutely one of the points of real friction between Polium and Murphy towards towards the end. Um, and uh, Murphy really had nothing against Polium until that time. But after that situation and Polium constantly then trying to hold it over Murphy's head, he was really he grew upset at him. The other National League owners were already very frustrated with Polium. And then at one point, Polium um, at a Writers Association dinner. Uh, gets up in front of the crowd and really rips the owners for how they behave and don't follow the rules <laughs> and just want to do what they want. And then you know, the owners at their next meeting say, we've, we've got to get rid of him. He's crossed, he's crossed the line. So it got real complex in a hurry because George W who owned Boston said, I recognize what Pulliam is struggling with. And I'm really hesitant to just make a move to remove him. We have to be very careful with how we do this. We have to take care of him personally. And the owners talked about proactively having an intervention with Pulliam and his personal health with his family. And ultimately they decide not to, um, but that's a long answer. So sorry about that. But you, uh, your point is so interesting and you're absolutely right. It was absolutely Pulliam was involved and uh, resented not getting the credit for it. Thank you. Good, other questions? Well, Thank you very much, Jason. Are, are you going to be at the uh, convention selling the book? I won't be at the convention this year, I, which is unfortunate. Uh, I'll be I'll be teaching my middle schoolers, so we'll be you know telling fart jokes and like I don't know forgetting to write our names on papers. But it'll be <laughs> awesome. So I'll miss you this year, but hopefully next year. But uh, maybe if anyone's in Cooperstown this weekend, love to meet you and then catch up with anybody. And if not, we'll see you at the convention next year. So okay, I'm excited thanks. for that. It's been great to be with you. So thank you. Thank you very much. I, I don't think it's going to be a problem. I, I did ask for this meeting to be two hours. Saber scheduled it for one, but I, I think Zoom meetings just continue as long as you keep talking. Uh, okay, another owner with his own uh, set of controversies is Horace Stoneham. And uh, Steve Treader is here to uh, fill us in uh, on your award-winning book. Uh, go ahead, Steve. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Barry. I greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Before I begin, I'm just going to uh, tell everybody a little story about Barry Mednick that many of you might not know. Barry hasn't always lived in Southern California. Before he moved down there, Barry lived up here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And that's where I met Barry. He and I were fellow employees at Hewlett Packard. In about 1984, I think it probably was, Barry was the commissioner of the um, Rotisserie League. 
when it was still called rotisserie league and this was just starting fantasy baseball was just starting and barry of course is always you know a early adopter and he was the commissioner of our uh, fantasy baseball the Hewlett Packard fantasy baseball league and then it was Barry Mednick who then because he knew people who knew people he knew about Sabre I didn't know anything about Sabre Barry recruited me to join Sabre and he and I went together we went up to Oakland to the 1985 uh, national convention in, uh, in Oakland so so Barry Mednick has a lot to blame for the for for what all's happened since um, this is the book we're going to be talking about today 40 years of giant the biography of Horace Stone. And why did I write this book about Horace Stone? Because his is a big story in baseball history that that has not been told and deserves to be told. I, there's no bigger, more diehard San Francisco Giants fan than me. But, you know, when I was a kid and, and, and Stone owned the Giants, I didn't know who he was. I vaguely knew his name, but he was never, uh, you know, in the news and and his profile, his, 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 uh, People, the no, most fans didn't know anything about him, and that's not fair. He he deserves his story deserves to be told. He's one of the most important figures in baseball history. Um, can I share my screen, Barry? Let me see if this will work. Uh, can you now see my screen? Yes, you can. So let me do this. Let's show from beginning. There. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in a whole lot of detail. There's just uh, some photographs that'll just sort of touch on some of the main themes of Stoneham's life and career. And then we can, I want to hear what you guys want to want to talk about. We can talk about Stoneham in the Q&A. Um, this is the fellow Horace Stoneham, uh, 1903 to 1990. And he owned the San Francisco Giant, New York and San Francisco franchise for 40 years, which in and of itself is one of the most rare things in baseball history. Very few individual owners have owned any team for that long. Um, he inherited the team from his father, Charles Stoneham. Um, Charles Stoneham had bought the team in 1919 and died in 1936, and thus Horace inherits. Uh, Charles Stoneham is a wild, wild character, one of the most crazy characters. He was a self-made uh, uh, millionaire, multimillionaire um, in the securities business in Wall Street, uh, buying and selling stocks and other securities. He was crooked as the day is long. He was dishonest, um, indicted many times, never convicted because he knew how to pay off judges and that kind of thing. But he was a wild character and one of the very richest uh, people in, in the United States, one of the very richest men in New York when he bought the Giants. Understand the New York Giants in 1919 weren't just any of their ball club. They were the premier baseball team in baseball. This is before the Yankees had risen. This, the Giants were it. In New York, the biggest city, they were the biggest team. They were the biggest, you know, property in professional sports at the time. Um, and Charles Stone and Bottom, because Charles and his son Horace were huge Giants fans, loved the game, and Charles bought the team for his son. They were to be um, uh, Charles's legacy that he was going, he planned to hand down to his son, Horace. That was the plan all along. They were Horace's team, bought and paid for by his dad. This is little Horace. Um, he grew up in, very different from his father, he grew up in just indescribable wealth and, and splendor in Nouveau Riche, uh, New York in the early 20th century. Um, here he is in about 1920. Uh, Horace's father, Charles, for all of his wealth, um, never had never gotten an education. He dropped out of school when he was a kid, and he wanted better for his son. He wanted his son, Horace, to go to college and be, and be educated. Well, Horace went to Fordham um, in New York, and in Horace's story, he went for about four days. I think that's probably an exaggeration, but he dropped out quickly, much to his father's frustration. His father couldn't figure out what to do with this kid. And so finally, his father sent him off to Copperopolis, California. I don't know if you may, may some of you may know where Copperopolis is. It's in this, the foothills of the Sierras uh, near Mariposa, west of Yosemite. It's as remote and, and far off the beaten path as you can possibly get from Manhattan. Uh, Charles Stoneham owned a silver mine, I'm sorry, a copper mine in Copperopolis, and he sent his son out there to work in a copper mine to get his ass in gear and get himself straightened out. So 
quite the adventure. Took him about a year, but he got good reports. Charles did that Horace was 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 working hard and, and growing up. And so he was called back by Charles to go work for the Giants. And so he worked for the Giants for his father. He didn't just have an empty title. Uh, Horace worked hard. He did he he worked in every aspect of the operation from the stadium, the, the groundskeeping, the ticket operations, the traveling uh, uh, arrangements. He did everything to learn how to operate the team uh, gradually. And then when Charles dies of kidney disease in 1936. Horace inherits a team at the age of 32. He's one of the youngest owners ever to own a, a major league team. And it's not just any team, but once again, it's, it's the Giants in New York. Um, Horace in New York was famous, though he tried not to be. He didn't want to be well known, but he couldn't escape it being the owner of the Giants. Uh, his best friend, truly his best friend, was the fellow on the left side of this photograph here, Toots Shore. Um, Horace and Toots were, were great friends. In fact, Horace uh, was a financial backer for Toots and helped him uh, buy his, his bar and nightclub, which became famous. Uh, they were lifelong friends and family friends. And in fact, Toots Shore was the godfather um, to Horace's um, oldest daughter, who we see here, uh, Mary uh, Stonamuchi was her nickname. And they were all um, very, very close and good friends. Uh, Charles uh, Horace had another uh, a child, a son named Charles, uh, after his grandfather, whose nickname was Pete. Uh, and it was Pete who was planned to take over one day from Horace and keep the family legacy going of owning the Giants. Uh, this is Mary's wedding day in 1949. This is one of the biggest social events in New York. Everybody in baseball was there. Um, a grand, grand event. Uh, the the uh, reception was at the Waldorf Astoria, a big, big deal. Um, and here's Pete, the younger, the younger child, the son. Um, Pete was uh, was planned by uh, Horace to take over to to and, and he put him to work just as his own father had. He put him to work in various aspects of the Giants business to uh, to eventually take over ownership from Horace at the at the at the time. Among the many things that Horace Stoneham did, and we can talk about all these things, obviously he moved the franchise from New York to San Francisco, the whole adventure with O'Malley, we can talk about how that all happened. But among the other things that Horace Stoneham did was he was a pioneer in forging the relationship uh, between American baseball and Japanese baseball. He traveled there several times. This uh, photograph is from his trip in 1970. Um, because, and he did this uh, working closely with Lefty O'Doul, of course. Lefty O'Doul had been an employee of the Giants, a player for the Giants, and it was Lefty O'Doul who went to Japan and uh, helped organize the Yormuri team that became known as the Yormuri Giants, the Tokyo Giants. And that was because of the Giants, the New York Giants. They adopted the New York Giants logo and, and color scheme and everything in honor of uh, Horace Donald's team, the New York Giants. Um, Pete, the son, uh, never managed to uh, rise to the occasion. He became a very, very uh, severe alcoholic in a tragic uh, drunk driving accident in 1958 in Scottsdale, Arizona, occurred in which Pete was driving drunk on the wrong side of the road and his car crashed into another and killed uh, an occupant in that car. A terrible scandal. Um, Horace Stoneham, with his wealth and influence, was able to make sure that his son didn't go to jail on a manslaughter charge that he was charged with. And the whole thing got kind of quietly dismissed, but it ruined uh, Pete's reputation within baseball. And he was never able to gain credibility and um, influence and become um, a significant member of the Giants organization and was never uh, able to take over uh, from his father, which was one of his, it, it was his father, Horace's greatest uh, disappointment in life. But Horace loved um, his family nonetheless, was a devoted uh, uh, grandfather to his grandchildren, his three granddaughters and one, and one grandson. It was through the granddaughters, the, the youngest one here, uh, Jamie, it was through the granddaughters that I was able to, to, get to get to see these photographs and get to know a lot about Horace's family life. And, and they were invaluable in, uh, in getting me to do the research and write the book. 
Um, Horace adored his father, revered his father, and this big portrait here of Charles Stoneham always held, always hung over, over Horace Stoneham's desk when he when he owned the Giants. Horace never uh, uh, forgot how his father, what his father had done for him, and he always strove very hard to honor his father's legacy and to and to um, hold up his end of the bargain. His father bought the team for Horace, and Horace was not going to let his father down, and he. Horace Stoneham, you know, was not a perfect man, and he wasn't a genius, and he knew it. Um, but he was smart, and he was very hardworking, and he um, did his very, very best with the Giants over 40 years. Um, the Giants weren't great, uh, but they were consistently good. Um, and among Horace Stoneham's achievements, understand this about Horace Stoneham: he wasn't just the owner, uh, the way his father was. Uh, he wasn't just the owner of the Giants, the way Walter O'Malley was the owner of the Dodgers. Horstone was the owner of the Giants, and he was the general manager. Um, he inherited Bill Terry as the general manager when he bought the team, but when Terry resigned in 1942, Stone never replaced him. Horstone never replaced him. Horace Stone became the general manager of the Giants, and he was the guy. He ran the team in every aspect. He made the trades. He negotiated the contracts. He decided who got cut and sent down to the minors and everything. He ran the team as well as, as writing all the checks, being the owner. It was a remarkable, a remarkable run. The only, uh, you know, the, the, there's very few owners like this in the history of baseball, of modern baseball. Anyway, Connie Mack would be a kind of a comparable, um, uh, somebody compare him to there. Calvin Griffith with the Twins. It's kind of the same way, although Calvin Griffith nominally uh, 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 hired a general manager to, to, to run things. But it's, it's, a, it's an amazing story about he, he you, we have to understand Horace Stone not just as a as a capitalist, as an owner, as a businessman, but as a as a competitor. He 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 built the Giants and, and rebuilt them several times over his 40 years. Uh, so anyway, that's that's all of the pictures I have. Um, so we can go ahead and hear what you guys want to talk about. Uh, Steve, you obviously have a lot of respect for Stoneham. Uh, how do you deal with his reputation as, a, as an alcoholic and a puppet of O'Malley? Um, um, that's an excellent question, because whatever uh, reputation or, or image that exists of Horace Stoneham, or at least, at least hopefully existed before this book got written, um, was those two things, exactly, that Horace Stoneham was a nice guy. Everybody knew he was a nice guy. Everybody liked Horace Stoneham, but... He didn't, in the public eye, at least, he wasn't very well respected for two reasons. Number one, because he was a very heavy drinker. He absolutely was a, was a, I would describe as a high functioning alcoholic. Um, uh, you know, he, he, he went to work every day, worked every day, you know, met his obligations, but uh, drank to the point of intoxication every day. In that regard, by the way, he was not unusual. Um, among baseball owners, you, you could say the same thing about Tom Yockey, Bill Veck, um, you know, Ted Turner, and Gussie Bush, many, many others were uh, hard drinkers as well. It, it, in business as in general, that's the way it was uh, in a lot of ways back in those days. Um, but still, it, you know, it, it was a weakness. It, 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 it was a way in which he was not as as strong as he otherwise would have been, his relationship with O'Malley, the, the, the image that the folklore taught us was that O'Malley was a schemer and, and, the, and the, 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 the Machiavellian, you know, genius who worked the move out, and he convinced Stoneham to come along with him, and Stoneham kind of, you know, bewilderingly said, sure, fine, whatever, I'll go along with it. That's simply not true at all. The facts simply do not support any of that. Um, Stoneham was going to move the Giants. Stoneham was going to was more resolved to move than O'Malley was. Um, O'Malley really, really did try to work with Robert Moses in the city of New York to get a new stadium built for the Dodgers. And, and, and O'Malley was willing to put up the money for the stadium. He just needed the city to find him a site and, 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 and allow it to be built. Um, Stoneham never really pursued that with much energy. He kind of went through the motions, but Stoneham, both of them had to move because the ballparks were outmoded by the 1950s. They were falling down. And most importantly, they didn't have any parking. And by the 1950s, you had to have adequate parking to attract people from the suburbs to come into the city. And so neither Abbotsfield nor the Polo Grounds was, was tenable any longer. So they were, they had to move. And, and Stoneham 
resolved he was going to move before O'Malley did. Stone was probably going to move to Minneapolis. If not Minneapolis, then he was going to move to either Dallas or Houston or perhaps, um, you know, someplace else. But he was going to move. In, and finally, in the spring of 57, O'Malley and Stoneham finally do, um, you know, put their cards on the table to each other and say, okay, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And it was O'Malley who said, look, let's, let's do this together. I'll move to LA, you move to San Francisco. And of course, it made perfect sense from both of their points of view to do that. Both of them in New York, the biggest draw they ever had was when the other team was in, was in their ballpark, right? They didn't want to lose that. They wanted to keep the rivalry alive. They wanted to sell tickets to each other. And Los Angeles and San Francisco were perfect rival cities for that. And so the, the move made perfect sense. Um, for both of their point of view. But if O'Malley had not moved to Los Angeles, uh, Stoneham would have moved to San Francisco. By that time, he was committed. He was moving to San Francisco with or without O'Malley, with or without the Dodgers. Okay, please go ahead and ask your questions. Uh, Steve, could you talk about Stoneham's relationship with Mayor Christopher? Um, yes, uh, the city of San Francisco um, is also not a innocent, you know, bystander. In all this. <laughs> the city of San Francisco was actively recruiting. What happens in baseball, right? The, the Braves moved from Boston to Milwaukee in 1953, and they are a stupendous success. They break National League record for attendance their first year there. In a, in, a, in a small city, in a city that had built a public ballpark to attract a major league franchise. So the, every other city that didn't have a major league franchise beginning in 1953 starts to work on getting one. Kansas City goes to work on it. Baltimore goes to work on it. And San Francisco goes to work on it. San Francisco gets a bond measure passed that very year. They have the money. They're going to build a, a, a ballpark and they're going to attract somebody. If it's not the Giants, it would have been the Pirates or the Reds or the Indians or somebody. They, they were going to get a team, just as Los Angeles was going to get a team. It was just a matter of time and who. Um, San Francisco in particular uh, had the stadium uh, funds built. I won't get into all the details of it here, but it was egregiously corrupt <laughs> the way they... <laughs> They built the ballpark. It did not meet even the faintest guidelines of fair public scrutiny and, you know, low bid expenditure, all that kind of, it was a corrupt deal from the, with this real estate developer, Harney, it was, it was a crooked deal, but the, but the mayor was well in on it. The mayor and the mayor's office were absolutely in on the fix in order to get it done. You will hear lore um, that among the ways they wooed Stoneham, the, the, the mayor did, was that they took Stoneham out to the building site, the Candlestick Point building site, in the middle of the day, right, when it's still sunny and the, and the fog and the wind aren't up, and they show them the site, and they say, this is a wonderful site, you have a great ballpark here. Uh, okay, but, but, you know, before the wind and the fog comes up, they whisk Stoneham back into the, into the car and take him back downtown for lunch. Um, th that's simply untrue. The, 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 none of that Take, took place. If, 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 in fact, such a photo op took place, it was only for, as a photo op. They didn't need to persuade Stoneham. The building site was already, the building site had been chosen long before. The building was already underway before the Giants committed. So the, the candlestick part was being built, Giants or not. Um, they didn't have to persuade Stoneham. He wasn't, the, he wasn't the, the, the client of the project. He was the tenant. He was just simply paying rent. So he had no, no input over the site. But you'll hear that sort of thing that this that Mayor Christopher and the city of San Francisco, you know, were, were they they were able to to convince Stoneham that 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 the, the, the candlestick was a great ballpark. None of that's true. None of that. Stoneham knew exactly what he was he was getting into. Stoneham did not understand how bad the weather conditions were going to be at Candlestick Park. Nobody did. Nobody did. Nobody quite grasped just how bad a location. That would be for a baseball stadium, but you know that 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 died and cast years before. And once it was built, it was built, and they couldn't they couldn't do anything about it. Steve, I was curious to ask you a question. the The Giants, the Giants are an organization that loves its history. So I was really curious. This is something that I 
was thinking about a lot of my process. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. What, how, how did you, how would you characterize the Giants' relationship with Stoneham in, in terms of being such a an important part of their their history? That's a great question, and it's a weird situation because yes, if you've been to the ballpark in San Francisco, what do they call it now, Oracle? Um, it's a gorgeous ballpark, and they've done a fabulous job of keeping the history alive, all the photographs and exhibits all around the ballpark, not just San Francisco, but New York. They've got John McGraw and Mel Ott and Christy Mathewson and Bill Terry. It's wonderful the way they, they give you the image of the whole franchise history, but not Horace Stoneham, not, or Charles Stoneham, not one picture, not one you know display of the Stoneham family, I do not understand. I, I think there's some politics of it that goes way back to McGowan and Lurie or something about when they were organizing the, the stadium, there was some bad blood, I guess. I, it makes no sense at all. Um, because Horace Stoneham is a huge fit. There would not be the San Francisco Giants had not Horace Stoneham personally made the decision to move the team. He was the one guy that, that made it all happen. Uh, it's it's a weird, glaring um, uh, deficit in their in their their proper honoring of their franchise history, and I hope one day it, it it is rectified. I hope there is a, if not a statue, then you know a, a photograph, a, a display, something at the ballpark that recognizes uh, Horace Stoneham because he he deserves it. Horace Stoneham also deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, by the way. The owners, you know, whatever they call the owners. Uh, if there is such a thing as a Hall of Fame owner, and I think Walter O'Malley is one, and he's properly honored um, in Cooperstown, Tom Yawkey, of all people, is in the Hall of Fame. Um, if those figures, uh, you know, Branch Rickey, if those figures are to be honored in, in Cooperstown for their impact on the game, then Horace Stoneham absolutely deserves the same honor. I have a quick question. You know, uh, you'd mentioned a, his hands on kind of approach. And I know I've read some things, a lot of things about his relationship with Leo DeRocher and, and other people that were involved directly with the operations. But but wasn't Chubb Feeney kind of the guy in terms of making an awful lot of the decisions associated with the I mean, more than more than Horace was because I keep hearing about his alcoholism. It's, it's, it's like, well, you know, how's that work? It's a that's a great question, and it and it's a, a common misunderstanding because Chubb Feeney had the title of general manager from I guess probably in the late fifties he he got that title and held it until he left the Giants in nineteen sixty nine to become the president of the National League. Chubb right. Feeney was titled the general manager, uh, but he was not in fact the general manager in the sense that we understand it to be in baseball. He was the general manager in the sense that you know, a, a, a normal business as a general manager, he ran the day-to-day -day operation, he administrated the operation, he made sure that all the, the, the finances and everything was done. And he himself said, uh, when it came time to make a trade, he, Chubb Feeney executed Horace Stoneham's orders. Stoneham would negotiate the deal with the fellow GM, and then he'd tell uh, Chubb, okay, you finalize it, and you announce it to the league and you go announce it to the press. And Chubb was the first to admit it. No, no, I, he, I, I don't do the trades. Uh, Horace does. Now, Horace did so in a very collaborative style. Horace Stone didn't make the decisions on his own. He was very collaborative. He, would, he wanted Chubb Feeney's you know, opinion and input. He asked for it. And not only Chubb Feeney, but his, his, his whole management inner circle, which included Hank Sauer, Carl Hubble, Rosie Ryan, Tom Sheehan, um, they were all consulted and, and, and he, their input helped Horace decide what to do. But Horace Stoneham was the general manager in, in the sense that we understand it in baseball. Um, Horace's alcoholism, like I say, it's, it's an interesting topic. He, he drank every day um, and, then, and the other Owners would make jokes about it, you know, at the owners meetings. Oh, my God, you know, we can't make this decision, you know, before before five o'clock because we'll lose Horace. Uh, you know, that's Horace did drink that much. That's not made up. But that's once again, that's not unusual. A lot of the owners drank that way. And, and um, a lot of the general managers drank that way. That's that was the that was the code of macho you know, he-man uh, business ethics in the day. 
Um, and it was not considered that unusual um, the way it, 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 it would be today. Could you tell us about Stonin's relationship with his stars, Mays, McCovey, Cepeda? Yes, yeah, Stonem was um, very paternalistic. He loved the Giants more than anything else in the world. And he loved his ballplayers uh, uh, to a fault almost. He was very generous with them. He hated to disappoint them. He treated them wonderfully well. The, the Giants spring training operations in Casa Grande, Arizona were, were second to none in terms of accommodating the players. He went out of his way to be um, extra uh, watchful of his biggest stars. You know, when Mays uh, uh, was acquired from the Negro Leagues and came to New York, it, it happened so fast. Within, within less than a year, Mays went from uh, Birmingham, Alabama to, to playing center field for the Giants. Um, and this was in Jim Crow, you know, Harlem, New York. It was, it was not an easy place for Mays to be at the age of 19 and 20. Stoneham took care of him. Stoneham hired a guy named Frank Forbes, uh, a boxing promoter and a guy in Harlem who could sort of serve as Mays's, not exactly bodyguard, but his, his big brother, his protector. He made sure that Mays was, was, was you know, got, got a, a boarding house in Harlem and was taken care of and the bad elements were kept away from Mays. Um, Mays, of course, was a terrible uh, financial manager and always spent beyond his means, even though he was, you know, the highest player and paid player in, in the National League. He was always, a, Stoneham was always advancing him his next year's salary. <laughs> uh, so Mays was, was indebted to Stoneham in that way. When um, the whole thing uh, 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 came to a head and Mays was traded by Stoneham to the Mets, that was for Mays' financial security because Stoneham couldn't afford to, to support Mays in retirement and the Mets could, Stoneham did that entirely for Mays' benefit. Um, he hated to do it. He loved Mays and he hated trading him, but he did it for Mays' financial benefit. And that, that's because he could not bear to see Willie Mays not, uh, not be financially cared for. Uh, you, can, you, you can read, you know, there was, it was sometimes paternalistic to a fault. Um, he didn't treat Mays as an adult. He treated Mays like a child. Um, there's some, you know, racial aspect there that's, that's, that's not very, uh, very comforting, but, but uh, truly a uh, horse thumb did it from a, from a position of love. He loved Mays. He loved Cepeda. He hated to trade him. He loved Marischal. He loved all of his ballplayers. Um, and in fact, one of the criticisms of Stoneham and with some validity was that he would players he traded away years before he would he would reacquire them in their last years, <laughs> not because they were any good anymore, because he loved them and he wanted to have them back in the family. He, he, he was a he was a uh, among the things that that uh, are true about Horace Stoneham was that everybody who knew him, who really knew him loved him. Nobody has a bad word to say about Horace Stoneham. They kind of, you know, roll their eyes and joke about him sometimes, but 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 he was a, a good person and he wanted to do the right thing. And he 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 went out of his way to make sure that his his ball players were as as well taken care of as he could afford. Uh, do you talk about the transition, his last year in the game? Yes. As soon as uh, the A's moved to Oakland in 1968, things start to go sideways for the Giants. They, they, they performed quite well financially through 1967, but beginning 1968, their attendance basically gets cut in half. And Stoneham wasn't a wealthy guy. He, the, 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 his father had been terribly wealthy, but but he lost it all in the, in the depression. And the only thing that he, the only asset they had left was the Giants. The Giants were the only asset Stoneham had. And if the Giants weren't making money, Horace Stoneham was in dire straits. And over the years in the late 60s and early 70s, Stoneham's financial situation becomes more and more dire. Finally, in 1974, the team has a bad year and the, and they're, the only chance the Giants had at that point was to win the pennant again and draw some fans and make some short-term money and, and find a way out. But it wasn't happening. 
Uh, so Stone is going broke and the league, the National League steps in to sort of front Stone of money to keep the team operating while he finds a buyer. Uh, everybody, uh, both Stoneham and the National League, wanted to find a buyer to keep the team in San Francisco. Walter O'Malley especially wanted the National League to keep the team in San Francisco because Walter O'Malley didn't want to lose the San Francisco Bay Area from the National League. He, Walter O'Malley's the Dodgers made a lot of money when they went up to, to Candlestick Park. It was the one time the Giants drew well was the Dodgers were in town. Um, so the league, the league and Chubb Feeney, the league president, you know, at his side, the league tries to broker a deal for the Giants to sell the Giants. However, the reason the Giants were for sales because Candlestick Park was a terrible ballpark and whatever owner, new owner bought the Giants was going to be buying the Candlestick Park situation and nobody was attracted. That the, the, the money just didn't add up. And so finally, the only, the only, uh, the only offer that met Stoneham's price was an offer from Toronto. And so the Giants were going to be moved to Toronto in 1976. And O'Malley was trying to delay this. And they finally, George Moscone, the new elected mayor of San Francisco, comes in and gets a court to, to, to put an injunction, a delay, uh, to give them one last chance to find a San Francisco buyer. The deadline, I think, was something like five o'clock on April 2nd, 1976. If, if San Francisco couldn't come up with a buyer, the Giants were going to be sold to Toronto. Within hours before that deadline, Bob Lurie, the, the San Francisco guy who wanted to buy the team but only had money for half of it, gets a phone call from somebody called Bud Herseth in Arizona. Bob Lurie had never heard of Bud Herseth. Nobody in baseball had ever heard of Bud Herseth. But Herseth called him, cold called him, heard about the situation, cold called him out of the blue from Phoenix, Arizona, and says, look, I got $4 million bucks. I'll put a, I'll be your partner. And on the telephone, um, first time they'd ever talked, they come to agreement. Okay, Lurie puts up four million. Herseth puts up four million. Lurie's going to be the ad, the managing partner. Herseth said, "Fine, I'll be a silent partner. I just put up my four million. And within minutes, before the deadline was to, to expire, they came to an agreement and they called the league. And the Giants were sold to Bob Lurie and stayed in San Francisco. It was that close. I had never really thought about this, but it, it just it occurred to me just the other day. If the Giants moved to Toronto in 1976, the American League would not have expanded to Toronto in 1977. Where would that other expansion franchise have gone? What would have become of San Francisco? Would the National League have found another team? But Candlestick Park is still Candlestick Park. I mean, how all that might have transpired had the Giants moved to Toronto is a, is a fascinating question. And it, it came very, very close to, to coming true. Yeah, there was, you reminded me of a story. There was a local guy who was, the Chronicle said he was gonna buy it. He shows up at the ballpark, everybody cheers him. Turns out he really doesn't have any money. Do you remember this story? I, I don't remember that one in particular, but there was a lot of that kind of stuff going on over it because the, 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 this went on from the spring of 75 all through the 1975 season. The Giants were for sale and they're looking for a buyer all through the fall and winter of 1975. This goes on. Buyer after buyer comes in and takes a look. Danny Kay was going to be one of the buyers out of, out of Seattle. Um, Herman Franks was going to be one of the buyers. Um, you know, Mike McCormick, the former pitcher, was putting together a group. A lot of guys, uh, a, a group of San Francisco fans, figured let's just let's just be it, make it a co-op, right? We'll just we'll just we'll just buy the Giants like the Green Bay Packers are. There'll be a, a a cooperative venture. All these things were seriously tried, but just nobody could make the math work. The Giants were in sorry financial situation, and so long as they had to play at Candlestick Park, and by the way, they had a 30-year lease on Candlestick Park. They weren't going to be able to move. Um, nobody could could see a way to make it to make it work. The only reason that Bob Lurie did it was not because he thought that he could make any money. It was because he was a San Francisco guy and he didn't he couldn't bear to see the team leave. And George Moscone, the mayor, uh, you know, didn't want that to happen. So there was a, a whole lot of hope that they, they could make a, a go of it. You know, 
within 15 years, uh, Bob Lurie was was selling the team, and they almost moved to to Tampa because they just mm -hmm. they, they weren't making money in Candlestick Park. Yeah, the exact same situation. Yeah, yeah, and the, and the the constant through it all was Candlestick Park. That was the that was the dead weight on the franchise. Well, that and competing with the A's for the the Bay Area Gate, both the Giants and the A's suffered with that. Good. Uh, please, other questions for Steve. Uh, you going to be selling your book at the uh, in Baltimore? Well, I would love to be saying yes. I'm going to Baltimore, but uh, with everything that's going on, I I decided I I just can't make the trip to Baltimore this year. I I I I don't like it, but I'm not going to be able to go in Baltimore. So, um, uh, University of Nebraska Press will be there. So if you want if you want to buy the book in Baltimore, uh, feel free. Um, but I'm definitely hoping that uh, hopefully by next year, by 2023, that the COVID stuff will be uh, will be lessened enough, and I, and I can again attend a saber a saber uh, national, which you which you and I, Barry, uh, you you took me my first one in Oakland in 1985. Yeah, my first two. Uh, good. Please, other questions. All right, well, thank you both. This was uh, very educational. Uh, appreciate a lot. These are fascinating characters. And uh, I wish you, how, how are the books selling, by the way? I don't know about you, Jason, but, uh, but uh, we're doing okay here. I will, I will learn more next month when I get my, my second year's uh, royalty check. Uh, but trust me on this. When you write a book about baseball, you want to do it as a labor of love. <laughs> because even if it does sell well, you're not going to make a lot of money. But we don't do it for the money. Yeah, Andy McHugh has said you'll never get rich writing yeah, about you baseball. You won't. School starts on August 1st. I'll be there. That's how well the book is selling. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going, it's going fine. I mean, uh, it's, it's great. No, no complaints. But, yeah, you're not going to – no no Grisham on the call today. Right. <laughs> yeah, and you know, middle school is hard because uh, the boys are 10 years old and the girls are 16. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's never boring. It's never boring. It's great. Thank you for uh, the chance to chat with you all tonight. It's been Thank great. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Good night, everybody. Good night. Take care, Take care everybody.